Hello, and welcome to Sobercast. We provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in a podcast format. We are an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting Sobercast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into the virtual basket. Also, if you're a member of NA or have friends that are, please tell them about our other podcast, NAPOD. NAPOD features NA speakers and workshops in the same format as Sobercast. We upload a new speaker every day, and it's easy to subscribe by searching for NAPOD, N-A-P-O-D, all one word, on any podcast player app, or go to NAPOD.XYZ if you'd like to listen online. Hope you enjoy the podcast and have a great day. Welcome to the African American or Black Experience in Alcoholics Anonymous. And I'm, uh, you know, <laughs> when I came to Alcoholics Anonymous, my sobriety date is October 29th, 1984. And when, um, yeah, yeah. I was 14. Uh, when I, Oh, boy. You know, I'm loving this. You know that. When I, uh, and when I came, actually, my, um, I, I got sober in Brooklyn. And, uh, and uh, however, my first meeting, I was working in the Wall Street area. And so, uh, and I won't even get into that. I thought I was a whole bunch of stuff, when I, but I was actually a clerk. But, um, <laughs> but I... So my first meeting, my first AA meeting was in Trinity uh, Building, uh, Exchange Views. It was a morning meeting. It was all the Wall Street types up in there. I walk in there. The only person that looked like me had on, you know, glasses with a Band-Aid on the glasses, you know. (laughs) Well, that was it. That was it. And, And I remember wondering, ooh, you know. But I was able to hear. And I was able to hear, so I could identify. Um, later on, I was told to go to meetings in my neighborhood because uh, if you don't have any money and you got to get to a meeting, you find a group that you can walk to if you need to. And so in my neighborhood, there were a lot of people that looked like me. And, um, and I started going in my first home group, which is Old Park Slope Caton in Brooklyn, New York. Uh, and, and the folks was like me, and yeah, I did feel like I belonged. Uh, not that I didn't think I didn't belong in the other meetings, but there was just something special when people who looked like me were there to welcome me, and uh, it, it just made it a better experience for me. And this is only my experience I'm sharing, and that's what we bring, our own experiences to Alcoholics Anonymous. So I'd like to introduce the first speaker, and that is Diana from California. Wow. Look at this. This is good. My name's Diana, and I'm an alcoholic. (laughs) And I'm going to set my timer. (laughs) And, uh, God, it is so good to be here and just, you know, just to be sober, to be sober. um, I'm thinking about those of us that are here who are at our first convention or new to sobriety, and I just want you to, if you can't see it or feel it, you know, AA works, and it works good. And um, I, I've been sober 32 years, August the 4th, 1982, and um, for AA. And it's been working for me for that long. And um, I came in when I was 15, and I really did. <laughs> I was like, I don't know. I've got witnesses here, so I know. It's true. And um, who knew? You know, who knew? Uh, I was 15 years old, and I was tired. You know, it was low mileage but thin tread. And... Um, <laughs> And we all know kids like that, especially today. And um, what I can tell you is alcohol worked for me from the very start. It connected me with life in general. I always felt disconnected um, and uneasy in my environment. Um, 
You know, I grew up in Southern California. My dad is uh, from the Coast Guard. He's a corpsman. We grew up in a Coast Guard family, and my mom's Canadian, which makes for an interesting story. And, um, you know, we grew up in the Coast Guard lifestyle and lived on, like, Guam, and then we came stateside, and... um, I always knew that I was different among different people, let's say. You know, being mixed is not all that it's cracked up to be, you know. Some days you're too white to be black. Some days you're too black to be white. And from all of that, and uh, the thing about it, (laughs) okay, (laughs) cool. Um, Yeah, the thing about it for me is, you know, my brother was cool with it, you know, and uh, I had problems, you know. First of all, I was, I had bad hair. And uh, that was like the disappointment of the family. And uh, I was like, oh, my, we go to Louisiana to visit my relatives. And, uh, oh, the first thing they, within the first hour, I knew it was coming. That conversation about getting me set up, hooked me up with the hairdresser, you know. (laughs) And uh, and I would go off trying to be nice and people please. And, uh, oh, my grandma would be, you know, go get your grandmother's purse. I'm going to give you some extra money because you got a lot of hair. (laughs) And uh, I would feel so ashamed of myself. Like, you know, I couldn't even be, like, I was an uh, embarrassment to my family. I couldn't even be mixed right, you know. And when I drank, uh, all that went away. I felt good. I love drinking alcohol. And drinking alcohol in Long Beach, California is good. Uh, it's good. <laughs> People want to know you. And, uh, and we grew up in the neighborhood. It was just all kinds of people there. And I had no problem getting alcohol, you know, which um, added to a very hefty four-step. And um, what I want to say is that um, my drinking took sudden left turns, and, and it gave me that connection. And you know, I would, I would find out later that I would be spending time, quality time, unbeknownst to me, with people of the opposite sex. And that would be really humiliating. I wasn't raised that way. It wasn't my intention. I just wanted to stay and have like two or three or four or hang out, get buzzed and all that. And every time I try to get sober and get clean up and act like other kids, um, you know, 12, 13, um, I would last maybe three or four days, and that uneasiness, the compulsion that I didn't know I had would set in. And all I'd want to do is go across town to hang out with my girlfriends, but then the car would roll up with my new best friends. And uh, you know exactly how that sweat falls on the bottle of the beer in the back. And, uh, and it would just be one more time, one more time. And when I got to Alcoholics Anonymous, I feel that... I wasn't sure I was going to make it because I was so young. And what happened for me, I feel, was the gift of desperation. After about 30 days of sobriety, I found out I was pregnant. And that is a souvenir you will remember, you know. (laughs) And uh, we stood at the turning point. For sure. And I was at a dilemma. I knew as a direct result of my alcoholism, I was I was faced to make some tough decisions. And I knew that, well, do I keep the baby and try to raise it and maybe I'll drink because I can't handle that? Or do I have an abortion and try to live with that? I didn't know what to do. But I knew at that point... um, I was just powerless, that I couldn't try to have the baby or not have the baby to try to figure out how to stay sober. I really, at that point, had to surrender to a higher power. Now, the meetings that I went to in Long Beach, people had, they knew this was the last house on the block, so they had no problem talking about getting a higher power. They were like, if you have to pray to a doorknob, you better start praying, because it's real out there, and it will take you out. And, um, and I was willing to pray and ask a God that I did not believe in, that I was afraid to understand to help me. And so I decided I I got an abortion and went back to junior high and uh, got sober and lived with that. And, you know, sometimes that's the thing. you got to live with some of your actions of of drinking sober. And and what do they say? You drink up the right. And you just got to learn to live with life on life's terms. And so I did. And what it did is it gave me um, the... the gift of desperation. And when you talked about getting sober in your neighborhood, you know, 
Oh my God. I was, I wanted to go to the, we didn't live in the black neighborhood. You know, my dad and mom, they lived, we lived in North Long Beach, kind of at the Compton border. So there was, there was a little bit of crossover, but you know, when you're 15 and got no money and I was scared to walk because of the reason I told you about, because I was afraid. I didn't know if I could say no. You know, I didn't know if I could not accept a ride from the wrong people. I was afraid. But one day at a time, people in Alcoholics Anonymous showed me a better way. You know, they give me rides home. Uh, it wasn't easy in my home. I'm one of those people that had to stay sober. Everybody in my house was not in recovery, and it was hard. And a lot of times I did not want to go home. And I'm so grateful because people in meetings, I think they understood that and they understood my circumstances. And they always carried the message about praying to God no matter what, asking God for the gift of sobriety and you will get it. And little by little, I've been led in that direction. And, oh, God, my first year I got thrown into service. Um, I'm a product of H&I, the Hospital and Institutions Committee, and... I really, I guess I realized by going, I was participant. Some of the people I was tucked under their wing because they knew I had a hard time staying sober on my feet. You know, I'd get mixed up with these, like, two-minute relationships. And uh, <laughs> I know, hold on. It gets better. <laughs> I'm just going to tell it like it is, you know, because the thing is, where well, I have no other place else to go. You know, AA truly is the last house on the block for me, and I know that somehow my story will benefit others, you know. If not, you will feel grateful. <laughs> I hate you. <laughs> or you'll get hope, one of the two, you know. I'll either be on your gratitude list or on your four-step, so it's all good. <laughs> And so I started going into H&I, and uh, these old-timers were tucking me under their wing. And so I couldn't, I would walk to the meeting I could afford to walk to, and that was six blocks to the Inner City Fellowship Hall. And uh, these guys, oh, man, they were a lot sober longer than I'd been alive. And we kind of were just like, eyeballing each other like they were kind of stood at the turning point too like oh wow you know they got to really carry the message and what my experience was is that they looked past the kid that was sitting there and all my hard-heartedness and just reached out into the heart you know like I love the handshake of AA it's like the heart of the alcoholic you know they just welcomed me and they carried the message to my alcoholism and they talked about sobriety as a way of life and to surrender to win and that, that sense of disconnectedness that I had experienced, there was a reason for that. I was an alcoholic. No matter what my circumstances were, I was always going to feel more than the other people. I was always going to overthink something, over-worry, get angry, fear. And the relief from alcohol is that connection. It's like that false connection to a higher power that I didn't know I wanted at the time. And through the, going to H&I, I met these guys that were not getting out for a long time. And what I realized, I didn't know, why is he inviting me? I'm 15, 16, and, and I have to say the law, I don't know, I'm not going to go there how he got me in, but we were going to Tehachapi, Medium, and Chino, and these state places, and Terminal Island. And so, anyway, at the H&I, these guys had nothing to lose. They were going to be locked up for a long time. And... What they did is they carried the message to me by watching this kid be at the podium and trying to tell her story. They were inspired, and they were trying to tell me to keep coming back no matter what. And that what I realized without knowing it is I had the first chance to identify with somebody who had nothing to lose. Like deep down in my heart, even though I was 15 and I had this thing, I always felt that uh, I never was, I never had a chance in life, and you guys all got to drink and have a good time and ruin your lives, and I didn't get started, and I was really mad. And, um, but they encouraged me to keep coming back, and so it really inspired me because I never in a million years would have thought that I would have gotten the, who I get the message carried to, and I guess that's my experience, you know, and I thought of African American experience in AA, you know. 
you know, my neighborhoods haven't always looked like me or the people I've gone to meetings with. And, and that's partly because of how I was raised. My dad traveled the world as a sailor, and I've always loved traveling and being with the, my mom, you know, oh, my God, you know, being up in Canada and with everybody. Um, I've always had – one lady told me, basically, I struggled with it in early sobriety, and I went to this old-timer, you know, up at the Southeast Alano Club, Diane. Some of you guys from Southeast, Sandy, remember Diane? Yes, you do, Peaches, I know. <laughs> hey. And, uh, you know, she sat me down and set me straight. She's like, you're never going to fit in. You'll always be both. you got to be yourself and carry that message. And where does God want you to be? And I was like, damn, you know, it would have been so much easier <laughs> if she would have told me to jump, jump across the street, you know. But um, so my journey has been, I'm sometimes that only black person that the newcomer sees in the meeting. And what I try to do, and I think to the 12 steps, is I allow God. I think the biggest, most powerful word next to surrender to win is allowance. Because I allow my higher power to work through me and for me. And so, and just try to extend that hand and share in the way that will help somebody keep coming back no matter who they are. But especially if they look a little like me, they probably have the same resentments and fears that I had too. And, um, and just to let them know that this program works no matter what. And I want to just close with a few things that I've, that has happened to me as a result of connecting with this higher power, you know, um, and our, my parents both came from really poor families, and we kind of all lived that way. It was like impoverished aristocracy. They would walk around acting like they got it all, but we were all so broke, you know. <laughs> and uh, and from a small town, and you know, every summer go into the same small town in central Louisiana, and they had a lot of expectations about wanting their kids to do better. And you know, through this program, I set aside a lot of my fears and the twist in my thinking, and set about going to school and. I'm one of those people, the more I allow God into my life, the more I don't have to be hard-hearted. And uh, I went to continuation school, and slowly but surely, I, I was able to feel like I could go to a regular high school. And I went to the poly high school and played sports and, and graduated with all the regular kids. And, you know, that was one of those turning points where the first time I felt innocent, just like they looked, like I felt like I belonged. I thought I drank that up, you know. <laughs> And had to deal with that. And uh, I was cool with it, you know. Sometimes you got to do what you got to do to stay sober. But um, going forward, you know, uh, I went education. I always wanted to be smart. I wanted to have degrees. And and I got some. And But it wasn't an easy ride for me. I had to start out, like, with, con you know, continuation. And then I worked for many years because I just couldn't do college. I could not handle the fear that came with success. And so I worked for a long time, and then I went to school and eventually found that I fell in love, and it helped me connect with the higher power. I fell in love with chemistry and science, and I found that that is truly how I connect with God. You know, a lot of our big book uh, has metaphors of quantum physics and string theory, and I love that. That's the truth about my God and here and all these things. You know, I see God in a lot of interesting ways. And when I had my daughter... 17 years ago, I was scared to be a mom because my mom didn't have a big old basket of tools. And uh, I had a lot of resentments. You know, I laugh about it because she was a, a nearsighted white woman with a hot comb. You know, I was mad. <laughs> either <laughs> so I had to say the least I loved her but I was so mad I wanted her to not be who she was and what I've learned is being a mother all those fears and resentments and I was so afraid that I was going to hurt my kid and I have to tell you that um, I did the best I could and um but I was not a perfect mother. You know, my daughter's 17 now, and I had to make some big changes and surrenders in my program. And one of them is um, I had to really learn to bring AA to my home. And 
relying on a higher power. And so I started doing that and really trying to be in the program at home with my daughter. And little by little, that relationship was better because I was a yeller and a hitter. You know, and we don't talk about that in AA, you know, that's that other stuff. And and it's the stuff that takes you out when you got a long time sober and you're feeling shamed because that's that same step. I started to feel the separation that I used to feel before taking a drink. And I know how thirsty I get and I became desperate enough. And so I started to work with others, Chapter 7, and surrender that area of my life. And it got better, you know, and I've had to practice living amends and changing actions for 10 years at least. I'll, I know I'm going to be on her inventory, okay? <laughs> but through the 12 steps and living example, I'm going to have a smaller part. That's how I feel about it. And that's what I hope for. So I'm going to end. Um, there's so many people in the fellowship that I love here. And uh, but, what, you know, and I love my boyfriend. I was like, I really like my boyfriend. I've been single for nine years, and I don't know if it's because of that or just that it's just God. I allowed God to put a right person in my life. We have a lot of fun. We keep AA first, and, um, and that's a good thing. And then with my daughter, you know, I became, I went on to get a master's. And that was a challenge because I was really afraid to be successful and uh, go through that. And But little by surely, you know, I went through that and got a master's at USC and worked in the field of science and, you know, have always been able to keep AA first is what I want to say. It's so easy for us to go, especially when we got a lot of years, because sober self-will is just as deadly because... <laughs> Sober self-will. I'm so glad you relate because you know it sucks, you know, and uh, it sounds good. And, and I started so uh, last year and a half ago, I started taking the steps again because one more time. And what happens, as you all know, <laughs> it happens three degrees at a time. And then little before you know it, you think, I hate this meeting. I'm never coming back, you know. <laughs> And, oh, if that old heifer gets up again, I'm gone. You know, that's me. You know, I'm not nice in my head. And um, so one more time, my world became small. I was isolated, disconnected, and getting a little thirsty. But I didn't want to admit it. I was just going to try some other interesting, nouveau, new age thing. And all that stuff is good, but it ain't AA, you know. I say, that's AB. <laughs> that's AB. And they say, well, what's that? And I say, well, we don't know, but it's not AA. And you will find the difference. You will come to know the difference. So what I'll say is that there's no expiration date on sobriety in the big book. If I've been taking the steps, and I'm on step 10 again, and what's so uh, wonderful is uh, reconnecting with my higher power. And what I learned about God this time is it was just as simple. If you go to the person next to you and you just lightly reach out and touch that index finger, that is just how easy God reaches out to me. And that's just how, that is all the willingness and ability that I need to reach out to God. And God takes care of the rest. And that's been my experience reconnecting with God through the steps this time. So I'm so grateful for the opportunity to connect with you. Thank you. My name is Adrienne. I am still an alcoholic. And Diana, thank you so much. You know, she really was 15, for the record, since we're being taped. <laughs> I was not. All right, so. And I'd like to introduce our next speaker, who is Lewis R. from Pennsylvania. Hi, my name is Lewis and I'm an alcoholic. I am a success and a winner today because I didn't drink alcohol. That is through God's grace, the 12 steps, the 12 traditions, and the 12 concepts to make it the world service structure of alcohol synonymous. Happy anniversary, AA. The 
before I get started, is it, uh, uh, since we've opened up with the uh, preamble, I want to show of hands anybody with a year or less in the house right now. I, I want to thank you all because you're the reasons why I'm here. You're the reasons why I'm here, standing here, with the opportunity to speak before this body. But you're the reasons why I'm here, to tell you the truth that I've experienced in Alcoholics Anonymous. A, to tell you that AA works, and it works best if you do not drink. Correction. Uh, correction. If I don't drink. Constance attendance of meetings, a home group, and sponsorship. That's been my truth and my experience. And, and because of what we said in the preamble, my responsibility and my sponsor said, whenever you get before a body, always make certain that you speak to the new persons. Because with our long time in here, Bill W. and Dr. Bob would have jumped over all of us with time to get to you all to tell you all that same basic truth. The AA does work. You know, when um, I want to thank, first and foremost, I want to thank God for this opportunity, uh, the, the uh Convention Committee for this opportunity, but also want to thank the best AA groups in Alcohol Synonymous. That is the Living Sober Group here in Atlanta on 575 Central Avenue in Hapeville, Georgia. We meet Monday through Friday from 10.30 a.m. to 11.30 a.m. And also the Parkside Group of AA. In Philadelphia, you know, we meet Monday, Tuesdays, and Wednesdays, 8.30 p.m. Correction, I heard that, 7 p.m. <laughs> Somebody said he's still in the old book. 7 p.m. to 8 p.m., Monday, Tuesdays, Mondays, Wednesdays, and Fridays. Correction, Monday, Tuesdays, and Saturdays. Sunday, we have a guy's eye and stand of media at 1.30 p.m. I got some home group members here, and I do not need that. <laughs> you know, um, oh, also, I want to, uh, um, this is a family disease that I have, and uh, I want to give honor to whom honor is due. It says, honor is a seed when sown is a seed to access, and um, the matriarch of my family, our family, is here my mother, Mary Rhodes. I, I, I just kind of knew she was going to stand up, you know what I mean? I wasn't going to ask her to stand. She just just do a natural stand. You know, uh, uh, she is the wife of my dad, Lou Rhodes Sr., who has a historical view in Alcoholics Anonymous, being the first black delegate in all of AA. And I, and I also want to tell you, I just want to tell you how impressed I am with you and this body uh, of people in this meeting. You see, because, um, and, and thank you, Diane, for the way you handled and dealt with the disturbance, but more importantly, how the, the group handled this experience. Because, but for the grace of God, no matter what's going on, it could be me. And I love the way that you all are very impressive people, alcohol, sober, and recovery. Because ordinarily, I'd be over there talking about, look at that. And I can't do nothing about that. But we, you gave your attention, we gave our attention to Diana to continue her talk. And I, I really do appreciate that because it brings... It makes the first tradition come to life. You know, when we talked about this, when I, I, when I got this topic to talk on, it was like the African-American experience in alcohol, the African-American or black experience in AA. And the thing that came up in my mind and my spirit is, is there a difference? And the answer is yes and no. Because of racism as a spiritual malady in this nation and in, 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 in the earth, this topic is real and germane to me. Um, I, I was uh, 
in my sophomore year in, in, in high school, I was on the basketball team. I was the only black on the basketball team the whole four years that I was at West Catholic High School. And in the sophomore year, because I thought I, because of the impact of Alcoholics Anonymous on my dad's life and how he brought people of different ethnics and hue into our home, and I was growing up, I thought I was just like every other kid. But I do remember this incident wherein I uh, uh, was playing on the basketball team. We were playing Bartram High School. Bartram High School in Philadelphia is predominantly, yeah, right. Bar <laughs> Bartram High School was a predominantly all black, black and one, uh, one high school, predominantly all black high school, and we were predominantly all white Catholic high school. And uh, we played the game, and I thought the refs had cheated us. And I said, let's go after the game. I'm down in the locker room saying, we ought to go up there and kick their behinds. And, um, and I was very adamant about it. And one of the guys reached over and said, are you serious? Are you crazy? <laughs> really, our school is at 49th and Chestnut. We're over here at 65th or 65th and Elmwood. There's no way we get through the black community with trying to beat on somebody, uh, some black guys. And, but he's, one of the things he just said, he called me the N-word, and I took offense to it. I was hurt. And I, uh, uh, so now I'm going to fight, because you're supposed to fight after you hear that word. And a circle formed around us. Correction, a circle formed around me. <laughs> and and I, 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 I kept hearing people say, come on, Tommy. Come on, Tommy. Come on, Tommy. And I'm listening for, come on, Lou. But I never heard that, so I put my back against the door, uh, against the locker, and I'm, I'm ready to, I guess I'm getting ready to get beat up by everybody in here. First experience of that of racism in my, my life and how it impacted me. Called my dad, and he said, and I told him what happened, and I wanted him to come and rescue me, get me. He said, is that what happened? He said, get on the bus with them and come home. Get on scepter by yourself and come home, or walk home. I walked home full of resentment because he didn't come and save me. He didn't come and save me. So that was my first spiritual experience. You see, because I understand racism as a spiritual malady. Somebody being thrown off about something that I have nothing to do with in terms of color. Uh, so that's how I grew up. When I, uh, uh, and I became a member of the Philadelphia Police Department, and I am a retired member of the Philadelphia Police Department in good standing because of Alcoholics Anonymous. Thank you very much. <laughs> you know, and I drank, and I have this disease called alcoholism. But it's a disease that said, there's nothing, I don't have it. And I drank and got in trouble and got put out of different types of uh, positions within the department. And uh, my dad, who was in AA, never talked to me about uh, the program of alcohol synonymous. One time he said, do you think you have a problem with alcohol? My disease is always centered in one word, denial. Man, I don't have it. You know, um, when I finally, after several different types of uh, incidences, uh, when I finally surrendered to the fact that I had this disease, uh, I went to Chit Chat Farms, it's now called Dick and Karen Foundation, and, but that was at my second treatment center, see, because, uh, and I put together 11 months and went out after six years. And I went out for only one reason, one reason only, because I never surrendered to the fact that I was a drunk. Without acceptance and surrendering to the fact that you're a drunk, you must drink alcohol if you're an alcoholic. If you're an alcoholic. I am. Uh, but when, uh, when I asked my sponsor who's here, one of my sponsors who's here, I didn't ask. My dad called him, and he came over, and he 12-stepped me. Uh, and I went up, he, and he did what Bill did with Bob. He talked to me for about an hour or so. I don't know how long. And then we went up to, and it was on Christmas Day, December 25, 1980, and he said, 
are you ready to go? And I said, uh, it's Christmas. And he said, like, yeah. <laughs> what, what does that mean to you? You know, I looked at him and looked at my dad and I got it and went in the car and went on to chit chat. And after 30 days, I was getting so, I, I didn't get so, I was on the program. But while I was there, again, because of my experience, because that's what you would, I'm to do here, I, I was told, we, we were allowed to watch the Eagles play for the championship. And one of the most favorite Eagles fans is here. And, and uh, we said that you could, you could watch it up until halftime or before the meeting. But if, yeah, by the time the meeting came on, you had to, okay, uh, you had to, you had to go and, and um, hear whoever was speaking. Guy did very, something very simple. He pulled down the shades three quarters of the way down, and he said, and I asked him why he did that. He said, because just in case we, somebody look in, we, we won't get in trouble. I went over, the guy was doing what I'm doing now, giving a lead at a meeting, and he said he was dying of active cancer. He, he'd rather die of active cancer than active alcoholism any day of the week. And I said, that message was with me. But inside a treatment center, you were told you weren't supposed to keep secrets, and I... So I had to tell my therapist, see, I was the only black person in a 60-person community, but the important thing about that, I wasn't the only drunk there. But when I, so when I went and I told them that I was, I, told my, I asked my counselor, what should I do? He said, you stand before the body, tell them what happened, and, 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 and encourage the others to do the same. And I told them that, what I had done, and they went and said, and all the racial epithets started to come and ostracized, and I was ostracized up until the time I left treatment center. A guy who may be here at this international gave me a blue ski cap with a little ball on it. My youngest son came and cut the ball off, said, Dad, that is not cool. But, <laughs> but I kept the hat, I was, I, and I still have it today. Uh, when, I, when I talk about Lou Rose Sr., one of the things that Bill W. liked about him and now I understand in race for myself, is that my father believed in the traditions of Alcoholics Anonymous. He loved the tradition. The steps are personal. But what I never knew how to do was function in a concept called group. I've never known how to function in a concept called group. The Parkside group, he never declared, was a black group. It was an AA group whose membership happened to be predominantly black. Because we were already ostracized by being an alcoholic. He said, I didn't want to go any further with that in terms of labeling. I said, because you separate yourself from the rest of the Fellowship of Alcoholics Anonymous. I now understand that if, an ind and what he told me, he said that if an individual, his experience was that he was in North Carolina, went to a meeting, and he was not, he went and found the meeting, and they, uh, a guy eased in the back and said, can I speak to you for a minute? He said, yeah. Stepped outside. He said, our group don't allow blacks in this meeting. He said very comfortably, I thought the third tradition said the only requirement for membership is a desire to start drinking. He said, you're right. He said, the fourth tradition says <laughs> each group is autonomous, except in matters of affecting other groups of AA as a whole. And he said, in the second tradition, our group conscience has said, we're not having it. Dad left. When he shared with me that experience, he said it, they were right. He said, but if they were to stay together as an AA group, they'd have to embrace the, all of the traditions of alcohol synonymous. Five years later, they asked him to be his anniversary speaker. So that, yeah, in, 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 in alcohol synonymous, uh, racism as an experience is real. But he said if, 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 you, if a, a group of people embrace the 36 spiritual principles of alcohol synonymous, it will deal with any kind of ism you have, racism, sexism, homophobicism, anything that you consider, <laughs> you embrace these 36 spiritual principles, and it is so in my life. So at this conference, you know, Eddie K, would you stand up if you're here? Eddie K, you, Jim D, if you're here, would you stand up? 
these two, these two men, these two men are my sponsors. One's black, the other's white. That don't matter to me. The issue for me is about following direction. Good and AA. That's what it is. And thank you all for listening to me. Adrian's still alcoholic. Um, these are some of the things that we learn. Um, staying sober a day at a time. Um, we have each other. We support each other. We care for each other. We pray for each other in whatever manner that, and to whomever we pray to. And we get through it together. Our last speaker, Joan R. from New York. My name is Joan, and I am an alcoholic. I'd first like to thank my higher power for his grace and his mercy. My sobriety today is September 20th, 1992. My home group is the Conscious Contact Group in Albany, New York. What it was like for me is I started my journey in this fellowship on Sunday, September 20th, 1992. And the first meeting I went to was the KISS group in Harlem, New York. I heard two things in that first meeting. I heard one lady say, you do not have to live the way you've been living. I heard another lady say, let us love you until you learn to love yourself. And no one had used the word love to me in decades. And uh, they taught me simple things. Sit up front. Come early. Stay late. Take the cotton out of your ears. Put it in your mouth. Learn to listen. Listen to learn. You don't know anything about staying sober, Joan, so be quiet and listen to those who do. And uh, that's, what w that's the way we were taught, and I followed those instructions. Um, a day at a time, I kept making meetings. In my beginning, I made a meeting every day for the first three years of my recovery because by the time I entered into the doors, of Alcoholics Anonymous, I was so beat down, I didn't have any debate left. I didn't have any why was left. I was so beat down and in such pain. I didn't come to Alcoholics Anonymous to stop drinking. I came to stop hurting. And um, what happens when you stay is you walk into a miracle. And um, I remember the, there was a group called Riverton in Harlem. And most of the people sat facing this way, and then there was a certain group of people that sat facing the other way. And so we call that the Amen Corner. <laughs> and um, those ladies in the Amen Corner, they watch you in Alcoholics Anonymous. I have to warn you, for those who are new, they watch you. <laughs> and we were taught to, in the beginning of the meeting, to say how many days you have. And it was so important to me to count days that you could wake me up at 3 or 4 o'clock in the morning and I could tell you how many days I had. <laughs> it was important. And what they did is when you reach your 90-day, strangers would come up and say, congratulations on your 90-day. And you, How did they know? The love in the rooms of Alcoholics Anonymous is overwhelming to me. 
Um, one of the things that they did tell me was to make meetings like I drank. And I told them I drank every day. They said, okay. <laughs> you know, <come> on. <laughs> and, um, but you talk a different language. You use words that I didn't understand. I heard people say you need a sponsor. And um, where I came from, a sponsor was the person that had the money buying all the booze. So, I, of course, I wanted a sponsor. And um, I asked the woman to be my sponsor, and she said it would be an honor. And I didn't understand that at that time. What, the, what did that mean? And um, what she did is I saw her in a lot of the meetings, but I thought a sponsor should be one-on-one. -on -one. So one day she introduced me to another woman to say, this is my sponsor, and that gave the woman... So I went home and I called her that night and asked her, you know, if you had another sponsor, you should have told me. I could have cho chose someone else. <laughs> you know. I didn't know you could share sponsors. <laughs> and um, thank God for sponsorship. I would not have made it in Alcoholics Anonymous without a sponsor. Because one of the things that I didn't know is how to determine and make decisions about anything. So when I heard you people in the room say something that I didn't understand, I went to my sponsor to ask, what did they mean when they said this? And that helped me tremendously because if I had left it to my own devices, and one thing my sponsor shared with me, a sick mind cannot heal a sick mind. <laughs> and uh, so I was grateful to get those little snippets and whatnot. And as I said, I made meetings every day. And uh, the people in the rooms of Alcoholics Anonymous, they took the newcomers. They took us to different places. We went to all five boroughs. You got in people's car you didn't know. They would just say, get in the car. Where are we going? You'll, you'll see. <laughs> and um, you go to a different place, and they do meetings differently than my home group. Then they were doing it wrong. You know, I didn't know what I didn't know. But one of the things that I do remember about being in that meeting is I did see people that looked like me. And thank you so much for talking about that hot comb. Because <laughs> I got scars on my ears from that. But uh, I just remember how comfortable I felt and listening to people tell stories and I can say, I did that too. I felt that way too. I did that and thinking that it helped me not to believe that I was the only one who suffered as much as I did. And I need to tell you, when I came into Alcoholics Anonymous, I thought I would end up dead because I couldn't function and get anything because I had suffered so desperately. The rooms of Alcoholics Anonymous have a certain kind of power that you can't find any other place because I walked off the streets into a meeting. And those people, I couldn't sit still. I would sit in the chair for five minutes, get up, go get coffee. Sit in the seat for five minutes, get up, go get literature. I would read a paragraph in a book or something, and I couldn't remember. But no one said, get out. No one said, you smell, Joan, don't sit next to me. None of that. What you did is say, keep coming. It will get better. Just keep coming. It'll get better. No matter what, keep coming. And I kept hearing the no matter what, don't drink no matter what, get to work no matter what, do this no matter what. So I became a member of the no matter what club. <laughs> and um, <laughs> grateful, grateful, so very grateful to Alcoholics Anonymous. And I remember my sponsor is the one that said, Try to make as many different meetings as you can. I've been to a lot of meetings where I, my face was the only one that looked like me. And I felt uncomfortable at first, and then I found out by coming here that no matter where I go or what happens, I can go to an AA meeting and have an instant family. I've gone all over this country, all over the world, and have go to a meeting and I'm at home. And I didn't have that except for that beginning. And one of the things that she said to me was that this world is not just one thing. This world is diverse. It's got a lot of different people, so you cannot limit yourself to one group of people. And, you know, I didn't know that. I went to the nearest group. That was one of the things she said, find a meeting. I came in in September, so it was getting cold. So I chose Harlem 2 for 1 as my home group at that time because it was right around the corner from where I lived, and I could walk there. They told us to get in service as well. 
And I remember when I get, had my second year, a man said to me, I want you to be a GSR. I said, what is that? He said, I'll show you. When I came in, members showed and taught each other what to do. They didn't just tell you to do that. We have to have members that work with other new ones to show them what it is. I moved to, from New York City to Albany, and the service sponsor I had in New York City called a service sponsor, called a woman in Albany, New York, and told her I was coming, I'd like to do service. And this strange woman come ring my bell. <laughs> she comes to my house with a um, map, um, service, and I was like, what? they watch you forever. <laughs> they watch you forever, baby. And uh, I've never known that kind of love where people look out for each other like that. Where I came from, if you did something from somebody, they owed you. You can go back later and collect. In Alcoholics Anonymous, I find out you do things and you don't ask for anything in return. And my sponsor explained to me the reason we do this is because when we do and reach out to new, old, in between, whatever it may be, it's not to help them. When I go speak at a jail, when I go speak at a treatment center, it's not to help the people sitting there. It helps ensure my sobriety. And I needed to hear that because I could go to a place and say, I'm helping those people in there. And <laughs> I stay sober by doing the things that I do in service. I stay sober by doing the things and doing service in the Alcoholics Anonymous. I can tell you one thing, that at age 14, I made a decision that no human being would ever tell me what to do again. And that decision almost cost me my life. And as I said, by the time I reached the doors, I was at a place of help me or let me die. And uh, you brought me, but you loved me back to life. You loved me back to life. I did get into service and start getting demoted, and it keeps your ego in the right place when you say that. The member is the chairman of the board in Alcoholics Anonymous. When you're doing anything else, you're being demoted. It's the upside-down triangle, and I needed to hear that because I needed to be right-sized. I needed to be right-sized. But one of the things that hasn't stopped in all these years is I still do service. I still do things. I um, now have a four-day commitment. We have an alcathon, Christmas Eve, Christmas Day, New Year's Eve, New Year's Day, so I'm the treasurer, four times a year. That's pretty good for me. I do other things. I have people that I work with, but what we do is love one another. We love one another. We respect one another, and we meet people where they are. One of the things that my sponsor told me that I'm grateful for today is when a member comes into our rooms, it is our responsibility to teach them what Alcoholics Anonymous is all about. <laughs> our responsibility. And so that's what we do. The way it was done for us, for me, is the way I do it as well. And one of the things that came as a result of showing up is I found a higher power that worked for me. I had one when I got here, I thought. I had the one that my grandmother had and my mother had, the one that was punishing, the one that said, if you think things wrong, you're in trouble. So I thought I was doomed. How can you, how can you judge a person by what they think? I came in Alcoholics Anonymous to learn the truth about higher power and the loving, caring nature of my higher power. And I learned in here that no matter what happens, that life would continue to happen even after I stopped drinking, that the whole world wouldn't stop drinking and everything wouldn't be fine. I thought the world would be smooth and easy and level when I stopped drinking. That didn't happen. There were a lot of things. My brother introduced me to the Fellowship of Alcoholics Anonymous. He had 10 years in this fellowship and decided to pick up again. He didn't get a chance to come back and say, I'm coming back. My brother died from his first relapse in this process. And so it gave me that lesson that this disease kills. It kills. It's not something to play with. But it did what it did for me. It made me commit. And all these years later, I'm still as committed as I was in the beginning because I have not yet forgotten how I felt on day one. 
I still remember how I felt on day one, embarrassed, shame, guilt, remorse. I remember having a blue and black checkered jacket, and a lady asked me, are you cold? It was like end of no November. And I said, no. She said, um, well, if you need a coat, just let me know I have one. And I told her, I'm okay. But I had about four or five sweaters underneath that jacket. You know, I couldn't let her know that I didn't have anything. Homeless with a baby, I came in here. And in 2008, the area that I live in, Area 49, Hudson Mohawk, Berkshire, elected me to be their Panel 58 delegate. And I came down to New York City to do some service work. And I was telling a friend this morning, or yesterday, I went into a room at the Crown Plaza downtown in 2008 and said, how did a person who walked through these doors, homeless with a baby, end up here? Only through God's grace. Only through following the principles of this program. Life has, has done a lot of things to me and it's helped me grow up. And that's what I believe Alcoholics Anonymous does most. Helps us to grow up and take responsibility and have some accountability. A lot of things have happened to me that would have blown me out of the water. I lost my mother in February. And it was difficult to say the least. But I didn't have to drink. There are a lot of things that have happened to me. I've had brain surgery. I had brain aneurysms. I've had all kind of medical issues. Sober. And I didn't have to drink over any of it, and I knew exactly what to do. So I'm grateful to God for the program of Alcoholics Anonymous. I'm grateful to all of you for being a part of Alcoholics Anonymous. I'm grateful for those two men who, through the power of God, put a lot of different things in place that a fellowship will start that will last for 80 years. 80 years. That's a long time, baby. And if we do the right thing and keep practicing these 36 principles that were spoken about, it can be here for another 80 years so our children or grandchildren have a place to go should they need it. Thank you for my sobriety. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.